Oh no! I have spilled water on my desk. <laughs> Alright, I think I got the mess mostly cleaned up. Anyway, hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of CGC Weekly here on the CG Cookie Blender Training YouTube channel. This week we're going to be taking a look at wet maps, how we can create them and how we can integrate them effectively with our PBR materials. In fact, here's a render that I created a few weeks ago showing a ball bouncing out of a pool. You'll notice that as the ball bounces out of the pool, it kind of leaves a trail behind it. This is the wet map. Anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I have a preset Blender file here, and that you guys can download this Blender file as well. There will be a link up in the top of the description. I just moved everything around, did not mean to do that. We'll reset everything here. Um, but in this scene, we have a sphere and we have a plane. And basically, if we click the play button, well, I click play in reverse, you can see that the ball basically just pops down, bounces a few times, and then continues rolling. And basically, we'll be creating the same effect that I showed you in that render earlier on this scene right here. Now, if I pause the video here and switch into rendered mode, you'll also notice that we have an HDRI loaded up. This is from hdrihaven.com. And we also have a PBR material on the surface here that we're going to be working with and integrating our wet map with. And this is from texturehaven.com. By the way, if you guys don't know about HDRI Haven and Texture Haven, they're awesome websites. You have a bunch of free um, open source, or open source, I don't think is the right word here, um, a, a bunch of textures that are licensed under Creative Commons Attribution, so they're free to use in just about anything. So it's really awesome to see them. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started by creating a wet map. Now, in order to create a wet map, we first have to UV unwrap the surface that we're going to be creating our wet map on. In this case, we're going to be creating the wet map on this plane. So in order to UV unwrap it, I'll press tab to enter edit mode. And all we have to do is, since this is fairly simple geometry, select everything, press U, and select unwrap. And just like that, we already have our model unwrapped. Now, I'm not going to worry too much about making a pretty UV map because it is just a single face. Um, but if you do have more complicated geometry, you will have to worry about correctly UV unwrapping it. Anyway, once we have this UV unwrapped, we can come into the Physics tab, if you're not already here, and add a dynamic paint, or enable dynamic paint physics. Now, since we have the ground plane selected, we're going to want to select canvas from these uh, two arrays. It should be selected by default. And then we'll just click Add Canvas. Next, we'll select the sphere up here in the upper right, and then we'll also select dynamic paint from the Physics tab, and select Brush this time, and we'll click Add Brush. Now if we click play, well, you'll notice not much really happens because right now we're using um, vertex shading or vertex, I, I don't really know exactly what to call it, but the vertices are the things that are being painted on. And ideally we don't want these being painted on, but it's good for a preview. So anyway, I have this ground plane selected and since we are just in here for the preview, I'm going to come into the modifiers tab here, click add modifier and select subdivision surface. I'm going to change it from Catmo Clark to simple, that way we don't get the extra smoothing. And we're going to crank the subdivision surfaces all the way up to 6, or the subdivisions, not subdivision surfaces, that made no sense. Anyway, um, as you can see, our animation does slow down just a tad, but you will also notice that our ball begins to leave a trail at certain points. Of course, this is only when the ball is actually intersecting with our ground plane. So, we really need some more splashes over here. And in order to do that, we'll select our ball. I'm also going to stop the animation here because we don't really want this. We'll come back into the Physics tab. And instead of using the Mesh Volume as the paint source, we'll select Mesh Volume plus Proximity. Now if we click Play, you can see that the proximity, or how close you are to the object, is also being used to paint on our dynamic paint canvas down here. Now this is a little bit big, you know, because this is the area that's going to be wet and having an area that that's, that's that big is just completely way off. So I'm going to change it all the way down the scale or the paint distance down to like 0.02. Maybe a little bit higher than that, maybe 0.05. Uh, that's too high. The idea is that we want it to leave a dot every single time it bounces, maybe 0.04. There we go. 0.04 doesn't seem to be too bad. You will notice that kind of at the end here, the dynamic paint extends outside of the area that the sphere is in, but ultimately this is just kind of a preview, so we'll have to see what the final result looks like. We might have to bake it one or two more times, but hopefully it won't be too complicated. 
Anyway, once we have this down to a, a rough, you know, approximate of where we want that paint to be, we need to come into our canvas settings here and we need to disable drying because otherwise as our, you know, object leaves a trail behind it, it's going to evaporate and water usually doesn't evaporate that quickly. Additionally, we'll change the format up top here from vertex to image sequence. This will mean that when we export our, or when we bake, or I guess out there, yeah, export works as well, um, our dynamic paint simulation here, it'll be exported as a bunch of image textures. Next, we need to come down to the dynamic paint output settings. We need to change the output to a folder that we can remember. In this case, I'll go to my desktop, create a new folder, and call this wet map. I'll open that folder and click accept. You can name this folder whatever you'd like. I'm just naming it wet map because that's easy for me to remember. And then we also want to uncheck this box that says paint maps and select wet maps instead. In our UV map area here, we'll select our UV map, although most of the time, unless you have multiple UV maps, you shouldn't have to worry about this. And just like that, we are ready to start baking our dynamic paint. So I'll click bake image sequence over here and give it a few seconds. And our wet map has finished baking, so I'll minimize Blender here. And if we open up our wet map folder that I created on my desktop, you can see that we have a series of black and white images that display exactly where our wet map is. And it's a good idea to kind of go through these a little bit and look at them. Um, right now, they do seem to be a little bit of a low resolution. That's because this is our kind of like first bake, I guess. Um, and there are some things I'm noticing. If you look kind of closely right here, you'll notice that although the ball wasn't, you know, necessarily bouncing, there is some like skipping in the dynamic paint trail that it's leaving. So we can change this uh, and we can make this better by increasing the amount of steps in between each, um, each time it gets simulated. Um, but there's also something else that I'd like to add or like to change and that's the resolution. So because this is such a low resolution, it's going to look kind of goofy when we try and map it back onto our, uh, texture. So we need to increase this resolution as well. So I will come back into Blender here and we have all of the settings we need right up at this top area, right? So the first thing I wanted to, or this, I guess the first thing I wanted to increase was the amount of steps in between each individual frame. This will make things a little bit smoother. So I'll increase the sub steps to maybe two in my case. Um, and then I also wanted to increase the resolution. And in this case, I'll increase the resolution to 1024 pixels by 1024 pixels. Now, there's also something else we can do here to add a little bit of extra realism, and that is adding dynamic paint effects. Now, dynamic paint has a few different effects. If you saw my video on dynamic paint um, a while ago, that was a really fun video. If you haven't seen that, definitely go check that out. Um, but there's a bunch of different effects. I go over them more but in that video, but in this case, we're just going to use spread, and we're gonna set the spread speed down to all, like, all the way down to like 0.05, um, maybe even less, 0.04, something just very low. And now we can go ahead and bake our image sequence once again. It will take slightly longer to bake now because we do have a higher resolution and we have more sub steps, but hopefully it will come out looking just as good. Actually, hopefully it doesn't come out looking just as good. Hopefully it comes out looking better. All right, and our bake just completed in almost exactly a minute, 59.29 seconds, that's kind of funny. Um, and if we enter our wet map folder here, you can see that these images are now all updated and they look to be a much higher resolution. And if we look at some of these later images, you can see that we don't have nearly as much of that, you know, jumping. I guess we do still have quite a bit here. Uh, I'm guessing that's just because the ball is bouncing there. So that makes sense. Um, but down here where I was mentioning it earlier, there's almost nothing. There is nothing actually. Uh, so with that in mind, I think it's about time we start mixing this in with our materials. So by default, you can see in our scene here, we don't have the wet map displayed on our material. So I'm going to split my window by clicking these three lines in the lower left and dragging over and switch over to the node editor here. And as you can see, this is the material for this ground plane here. It's called dark plaster. All it is is just your standard diffuse. Actually, I forgot to hook up roughness. There you go. Anyway, uh, that'll be hooked up when you get this file. But yeah, so we have the diffuse map, the roughness map, and a normal map all running into the principled shader and just to the material output. So in order to add our wet map, we first need to bring it into Blender. Um, in order to do that, we'll press Shift A, come down to the texture settings here, and select image texture. We'll drop it into our scene, 
select open and navigate to whatever folder has our wet map animation exported into it. In this case, mine is wet map. So I'll open this and you can see we have all of our image files and we'll select all of them by pressing A twice or maybe even just once. Anyway, press A until they're all selected. Click open image and just like that, we now have our wet map imported. Next thing we need to do down here at the bottom is check this box that says auto refresh. And basically this will sync the images um, or whatever image is being imported with the frame we're on. So if we're on frame 60, it'll use image 60, makes sense. Um, and just like that, we can import it basically. Uh, so I'm going to use this color output and hook it into the color input of our principal shader. And just like that, you can see that our dynamic paint here follows our sphere long. Now you can see that indeed the proximity is a little bit large. So we might do, yeah, I'm going to do one more bake here. I'm going to drop down the scale, that proximity a little bit, bake it one more time, and then re-import it, and hopefully it'll be of a little bit better scale. In this case, I'm going to set the brush's radius to 0.02, like that. And then we will grab our bottom mesh here and click Bake Image Sequence once again. So give me probably exactly one minute again, and we'll be back on top of things. All right, so that new bake just finished, and as you can see, the wet map is a little bit more you know, on track here. It still seems a little bit big, but I'm not going to be too nitpicky. So what exactly do we need to do in order to accurately mix it with our PBR shader? Well, the first thing I always like to do is to use some color ramp nodes. So I'm going to position this all the way over here on the left, and I'm going to add two color ramp nodes. One is going to be used for the diffuse, and one is going to be used for the roughness. So we'll create it like that, and we'll plug the color output into the factor inputs of both of these color ramps. All right, perfect. So we'll start off by adjusting the color here. So in the real world, when you get something wet, 99.9% .9 of the time it gets darker and it also becomes slightly more saturated. So in order to create this effect, we're going to use the hue and saturation node. So I'll come to the color category here, select hue and saturation, and we'll drop it between the diffuse shader and the principal shader. I'll move it up a little bit. And basically what we need to do here is hook up the color output of this top color ramp into the factor input of our hue saturation value node here. And basically this will just say that it only affects, or this node will only affect our material in the areas that our wet map covers. So if I change the value to zero, for example, you can see that our wet map is basically masking out where uh, this node is going to be used. So anyway, as I said earlier, things usually get slightly darker and slightly more saturated. So I'm going to change the value to somewhere around 0.75 to make it a little bit darker. And I'll change the saturation to somewhere around 1.5. Like that, you can see that we kind of get this stripe going along here. I might actually drop the value down to about 0.5. No, that's too much. 0.65. Um, and we just kind of want to get that basic wetness going. Um, of course, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it should be pretty good. All right, and then the next thing that we want to do is drag the white slider up here all the way a little bit closer to the black slider. That way we have a bit of a harder edge on this. Because when we're working with, um, when we're working with wet areas, usually the uh, areas that absorb the water and become darker have a kind of hard edge to them. And then the parts that are more reflective have a softer edge that kind of gradients out. And we'll be working on that a little bit more here. Um, when we get into the roughness, which actually, you know what, let's go into the roughness right now. So in order to change the roughness, we'll use some math nodes. So I'll press shift A, come down to converter and select math. And I'll drag this or drop this math node right in between the roughness and the principled shader. And we'll scooch things around here so we have a little bit more room. All right, perfect. So with this math node, we'll change its operation to multiply. And we'll use the color output of our bottom color ramp and plug that into the bottom input here. And basically, what we've created is, well, right now, everything's really glossy. It's kind of hard to tell, but everything's really gl glossy except for our wet map. And that's a little bit backwards, right? We want our wet map to be glossier and more reflective, or sorry, not more reflective, but you know, shinier uh, than everything else. So in order to do that, all we need to do is just flip the positions of these two inputs on our color ramp. And just like that, you can now see that our wet map here is the wet object instead of our, you know, the rest of our scene. So this is a great start, but as I was mentioning earlier, right, we want the reflective area to be slightly smaller than the area that just, you know, absorbs water. 
So in order to do that, all we need to do is drag this white handle in a little bit. But I also kind of want this area to have some roughness, right? Because in the real world, almost nothing has, you know, zero roughness. I mean, I guess it is possible to create something with zero roughness from a perceptive, you know, position, but basically we don't want that in CG. So in order to accommodate for this, I'm going to select this black handle on the color ramp slider here, and we're going to change it up to, you know, a very, very dark gray. We can kind of eyeball it over here looking at the reflection in the clouds but it should be something around there. And as you can see, it adds some roughness, but not too much because it is water after all. That's basically how we create wet maps in Blender and how we can get these really awesome results. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys learned something new. And if you did, be sure to hit the like button down below. And if you have any other wet map tips that you'd love to share with the world, leave them in the comments. I'd love to see them and everybody else would too. If you guys are interested in continuing learning more about dynamic paint and all of Blender's dynamics, we've got an awesome course over on cgcookie.com if you hook yourself up with a subscription. It's pretty cheap and you get, you know, a lot of stuff for it. So I definitely recommend checking that out over at cgcookie.com.